All right, this is Kurt Russell with the Open Mat and Everything Penn State. Uh, we missed a week last week, and I got Tim Owen on the phone here from Blue and I Illustrated. Uh, I guess you've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks, huh, Tim? Yeah, it's been a busy the last couple of weeks. I was, uh, you know, unfortunately, with that, we were just turning last weekend. We weren't able to catch up uh, last week, right? So today, we weren't able to catch up after the Iowa match, so we have quite a few things to cover. Uh, these right now, I believe, this rest with the best that they have all season, and given their performance against Iowa two weeks ago, and then their really how I saw it, a commanding victory over Ohio State this past Sunday. Really, just kind of took it to the Buckeyes in eight of the ten weight classes, and really kind of, in my mind, have separated themselves from the rest of the pack in the Big Ten. Yeah, I, I definitely. Uh looking at that, I thought it was a really bad matchup for the Buckeyes, and uh, I didn't really see them winning much more than one or two matches, but um, uh, I guess we can take a look at, since we missed a week, we'll kind of look at uh, how all the guys did against both things. We can start off with Nico, who uh, I think um, it was kind of interesting that before he went into the match with Matt McDonough, he was saying, you know, to everybody around him that he thought he could beat him. Um <laughs> I think he may have been disappointed, but I think most of the faithful in Rec Hall were very pleased with the performance they saw they did with a uh, you know NCAA champ. Yeah, just for the match, you know, Nico was the most confident one that, you, that you'd find that he was going to win that match, and he kept a great, great close all the way up into the overtime period. Um, you know, he earned that third period escape, pushed it into overtime, and then uh, even though he gave up the eight down, I mean, just got to give him credit. That he was able to keep it that close with McDonough. And then McDonough actually went on the next weekend to beat Zach Sanders, who was the number one guy in the country by at least six points. Right. So that just goes well for Nico that he was able he's able to improve as the season goes along and keep such a close match with the national champ, like you said. And then he, he kept the momentum up. I mean, even though he lost to Iowa, that was kind of a momentum builder, kept it confident. It was that up going to Ohio State Sunday when he beat an, um, another ranked opponent, another ranked opponent that he'll put on his, uh, his resume. And it, I think Nico is going to, you know, he's set himself up well for the postseason. And uh, it's looking good for the seas, for the seedings, too, because since he beat, beat uh, Leva Melli from uh, Northwestern, Northwest, uh, he actually beat Jesse Delgado, who earlier beat Mac McDonough, who beat Zach Sanders, who beat Nico, so, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of how the, how the entire Big Ten is set up this year, Kurt. Everyone's kind of eating at each other. I mean, even if you look at the team standing, you have Minnesota, who fell, or who beat Penn State, who fell to Iowa, and then you have Ohio State, who beat Iowa, but lost to Penn State. I mean, you just... It's just all mixed up right now. Yeah, well, I, st- I still think McDonough gets the uh, the number one seed at, at this point, but uh, I think it's looking better for Nico, uh, possibly getting you know a four seed um, in there. So uh, I think Penn State has to be really happy with the performance he gave over the last two weeks. Yeah, he's definitely. I think wrestling the best he has all season. Like I said, most of the line up right now, uh, but that performance against. Uh, McDonough last week and, uh, when I was in town that really just kind of showed everyone where Nico was at you know just be able to push McDonough all the way to overtime you know that just really this shows a lot about Nico's improvement from you know when he wrestled Sanders back at the beginning of the year to where we are now so you know that's uh, for Nico like you said that should get him a top four seed that would that be that put Penn State in a real good position for Big Ten now the complete opposite of that, of course, is uh, 133. We've had Frank Marlotti come on, but he's had two really. I mean, he, he got pinned both times to uh, Ramos and to Stever. And um, I just got to say, you know, with Frank being like a, a three or four time PAWA medalist, he, he won a championship one year. I just kind of thought this is the last thing you would really see is him letting get, you know, he let Ramos get a cradle on him. He let. Uh, Stever get the uh, arm bar and the half Nelson on there, and with kids as good as that, you just cannot let them get a turning combo on you like that. Yeah, and they got it in there quickly. They, uh, they, when they got the combinations locked up, as you said, Ramos had a stiff cradle. Stever's got one of the best arm bars in the, in the, in the game right now. So, but the thing is that they got locked up, and they, they were able to turn them quickly, and it was almost like it, there wasn't a fight. But that's the thing is that's not who Marlotti is. He's a fighter. He's going to go out there this weekend. And he actually had two solid opponents again this weekend. 
and one of these ranked, uh, let's see, the Nebraska kid is ranked number 18, uh, Kylie, the Michigan kid, Steven, he just dropped out of the top 20, but he's right up there with some of the best 133 pounders in the Big Ten right now. So, Marlon, even though he had some tough top competition there, he is going to be able to bounce back this weekend with, with two, again, two really good opponents. Um, but, you know, like you were saying, it's, uh, he had some real good talent against him like, when he faced Iowa and Ohio State. And that's just kind of the nature of the Big Ten this year. And he's not going to really see much of a let-up this weekend when they travel to Nebraska because, you know, Kylie's had some good wins. Uh, Stevens had some good wins when Michigan comes into town. You know, the rain tower is really the time that he needs more to step up. So, you know, he can find some type of seed maybe to come go into Big Ten so he doesn't have to worry about stealing a spot from the other five or six guys. Yeah, so I think this weekend he definitely has a chance to um, try and get some momentum going. And uh, with the, the guys he has, I think he has... The capability of doing it. Because last year he got ranked up into, they think, the top 15, top 12. And uh, I was actually really thinking that he had a chance to be a national qualifier, maybe around a 12 guy this year. But if he's going to meet that, he's got to really turn some things around. Yeah, based on his performance last year, there's no reason not to expect anything less than a national qualifying performance this year. But that's the thing is he was at 125 last year. Yeah. He's making the jump up to 133. And, you know, that's sometimes a little more difficult than it seems. And it, I think right now Marlotti is struggling a little bit with that change. But also he's had some of the toughest guys in the country in his way in these first two matches. So, you know, if he can go out there this weekend and go 2-0, those those first two losses really are going to go to the wayside, and he's going to be able to you know refocus for the postseason. And I actually just got back from practice right now. I stopped in and talked to Cal with some of the guys, and you know Cal actually believes that if Frank can go out there and pick up two wins, that he might that Martellotti actually might be able to slide into the 17, 18, 19 range of the rankings at 133. Which you know I think he has to go out there and win by uh, you know. Pretty demandingly, but he's not far away. That's the kind of the point Cal was trying to make. Was he's not far away? He he, he got lost or he got beat by a couple of the top guys in the country, but he can still redeem himself. Good at one forty one. Um... Brian Pearsall, I bet, um, I'm very sure Nathan Lyon fans have to be really happy with his performance, even though he dropped two uh, matches. He wrestled very tough against uh, Montel Marion and uh, Hunter Stieber, and um, I thought he looked very good, thought very tough. He's the kind of kid, if I, uh, if I was Kale, I would definitely want a kid like that on my team. Yeah, and we were talking about this last time we talked Pearsall has reminded me an awful lot of Adam Wench, who wrestled yeah. for Penn State a couple years ago. I mean, just not one of the most talented guys in high school that you'd see, you know, but he always has stuck to it, plugged away, and it always seems to wrestle at his best against the best opponents, and that's kind of what Pearsall's done this year. And you saw just this weekend, he, against Marion, he kept it close, and then against Hunter Stieber, he kept it closer than I think anyone in Rec Hall would have Plus he got the credit for. He actually got the reversal on her too. Yeah, I mean he actually had some momentum going there. I think we was the second degree when he got that reversal that I even thought, hey, he might even be able to, you know, make cause some more damage here because he he's just a one of those kids who goes out there and rankings are on his mind. He goes out there and wrestles the same kid, you know, the week in, week out the or wrestle the kid the same way, week in and way week out, and, you know, that just is a good type of guy to have in your room, in your wrestling room, it's just good for morale, it's good for, you know, team spirit, and, um, you know, if you're saying, you gotta be, Kale's gotta be happy to have a guy like Brian Pearsall on his lineup, who, you know, he didn't even recruit, but like, really, he came out of the walk-on at Penn State, so, they do have to go out there and get two of the top wrestlers at 141, and with Marion and Steamer, you know, you just gotta give that kid credit for keeping matches so close. Well, and for next week, it doesn't actually get any easier because he wrestles uh, Jake Soufron from Nebraska, who I think is probably ranked sixth right now. Um, then he goes back home to wrestle Kellen Russell, who beat um, 
Andrew Alton three times last year, and um, that's going to be uh, very interesting for uh, for Brian. But uh, Russell actually lost to Hunter Steve earlier in the year at the Cliff Keen Invitational out in Las Vegas. So, but he just uh, reclaimed the top spot again because uh, Kendrick Maple got beat by uh, a kid from uh, Iowa State. So he's going to go, you know, continue run the gauntlet here. Yeah, one forty one is one of those. One of those weight classes too, where everyone's just kind of eating, eating on each other, uh, you know, the top five guys. But I mean, you know, Pearsall's going to get another taste of these two. I mean, you know, Kellen Russell, I think, is one of the best wrestlers in the in the game right now. I mean, even though he did lose to Steber, I think he'll he'll be able to finish that at nationals. But you know, Pearsall can go out there and keep these matches within decisions, like he's been doing. Really, that's the win for Penn State in the grand things here in the dual meet. I mean, you really can't expect someone someone to go out and you know, do much better than Pierce has been doing against these top guys. Yeah, I, I agreed. Uh, 149, Frank uh, did a really good job. I think i got to give Iowa credit for bouncing back uh, because some of those things on paper, they, they kept all of Penn State top guns, except for Ed Ruth from scoring a bonus. And on paper, uh, going against uh, Kelly, it looked like, you know, Frank should be able to get some bonus, but uh, Kelly Russell Tough even got the third takedown that uh, Frank has given up all year. And uh, then he had um, uh, the kid from Ohio State, you know, he got the uh, bonus on him. So he was wrestling some tough opponents and I think did very well. Four or five years since he's been on campus, and actually his that Ohio State the win that he pulled on Sunday that was his eleventh shutout win of the season. So that's just showing his dominance. You know, not only his his uh, his dominance on the feet with his defense, but also just the way he can ride the opponent's out and just you know control the match the entire time. That just speaks a lot for Frank how he how he's wrestled this year. Uh, but in Ohio State. They didn't send out their normal ranks no. at 149. So, you know, he went out there and, you know, did, did work been like he got a 12 nothing victory and, you know, put four points up on the board for a major decision. Now, this weekend, um, he actually is expected to receive the number seven guy when Michigan comes down at Corrales. I mean, they wrestled a couple times last year and Frank never had um, too much of a problem with them, but... You know, that's just a match that you're going to want to keep an eye out. It's just going to be another test that Molinaro will have before Big Tens and then, of course, Nationals in March. Yep. Uh, Dylan Alton had a tough match against Nick Moore from Isla and uh, and then against Demas. And uh, he just continues, I think, to get better as the year goes on. That, that original loss he had to Detchler from uh, Minnesota is looking uh, farther and farther behind the rearview mirror there. I actually was talking to Dylan for a brief time today in the practice room, and you know what we talked about is just how much he's really focused on his mat wrestling since the beginning of the year, even since he's been on campus. Because when he was in high school, he claimed his fame to his takedown ability. You know, he sometimes would rack up five, six takedowns, you know, within just a couple of minutes. So now he that he's at, at the collegiate level and. You know, what riding time is, is so emphasized, and he's really focused on mat wrestling, and that's something that's really improved since the start of the year, like you said, since the Minnesota match. And what you're seeing is him be able to grind out close matches by using his ride, which is something that he hasn't been able to do. Basically, you know, that just not, has never had been part of his game. So what you're going to see this weekend is he's going to have another tough Talked about at 157 with James Green, who yep. is the top top. Uh, I think he just went to number seven in Intermatch rankings. So that's going to be a real tight match. That's one one of the ones I have circled for the entire weekend. And you know that's gonna that's really going to give us a marker where Dylan Alton's at because yeah he's he's seen some other tough guys, but you know I feel like Green is kind of rated Dylan Alton's level too. If I'm not mistaken, he I think he's a freshman. Well, he's a true freshman um, from New Jersey. He he and uh, Dylan actually the match he had in high school with Dylan 
uh, went into overtime and Dylan got the takedown. But uh, that kind of put James Green on the map a couple years ago. Everybody saw like, wow, he's keeping up with Dylan. You know, who is this kid? And then Green actually made it to the finals two years ago, New Jersey State Championships. Wrestled a former Penn State recruit, Hank Stinson, and uh, Stinson got the takedown with like three seconds left to win the championship. And then Green came back the next year and won it. So he's a tough kid. Uh, Nebraska seems through Burroughs, to Jordan Burroughs, to have a New Jersey pipeline going here. But uh, it's going to be a really tough match uh, for Dylan. It's going to be interesting to see how he does. Yeah, it's definitely one that, uh, like I said, I have circled for the. For this weekend, one that really is going to stand out. The, not just is it going to be a good match, but it's just going to be another indicator of you know, how far Dylan has come since he's on campus. Uh, David Taylor did very workman like job off of uh, Mike Evans. I got to give Mike Evans credit for uh, keeping it. Uh, Keeping it under the bonus for Iowa, he did his job. Uh, I'm sure he would have liked to win, but uh, David was just too tough there. And then David did his usual uh, business on uh, Derek Garcia, who was a true freshman from Washington, just polished him off with a tech fall there. Not much to really say, I think. Yeah, I was uh, real impressed with Evan's performance against David back two weeks ago now when, when I was in town. Uh, you know, I just haven't seen really David struggle as much to score points as it is Evans. I mean, not saying that it was easy because Evans really just put up a solid defense. You could tell he went out there to keep Davis points to a minimum rather than score points for himself. And, you know, that's really hard to compete with when you wrestle a guy like that because, you know, a lot of times Davis, what caught Davis scores is just capitalizing on little mistakes from the other guy. And, Evans didn't really give him a lot of opportunity to capitalize, so David had to earn every point that he got in that match. And you know, that's, that's that's good for David though, because he doesn't get tested too often. And you know, having a guy like Evans, who he's bound to see again, you know, they're bound to see each other at least two more times. Um, I would bet, yeah. Yeah, so there, you know, that's, that's good for him to see that, see that type of competition early in the year. And the one thing you have to keep in mind is. Last year, when David and uh, Derek St. John they kind of had their battles back and forth start last year at 157, St. John had got closer and closer each match. So that's one thing you're going to want to keep with Evans. You know, they're under the same coaching. And, you know, if Evans keeps building towards, you know, keeps building towards David's uh, ceiling, you know, then we might have a really close match on our hands come come national finals or semis or whenever they meet in, um, in March. It could be a very close match. Uh, 174, Ed Ruth, like I mentioned before, got the only bonus for Penn State. Um, really did a great job on Ethan Lofthouse, who, who a couple times just was not even moving and got uh, hit with the stall calls, rightly so. And then, um, and then it was kind of funny because... In his post-match interview, Ed was saying when he was wrestling Heflin, he was finally able to uh, finish off the cradle. He wasn't able to get the Big Ten Finals. I don't know if you saw the Big Ten Finals, but he got two cradles on Heflin then and uh, actually kind of suicide rolled one of them and couldn't finish them off. And uh, uh, Heflin broke out of the one. And so this time, Heflin fought like crazy, but he he nailed this one. So, Ed, uh, go ahead. No, Heflin actually one of his cradles at the beginning of the match and then Ruth blocked up the second one and that stuck him I think with a two minute five second fall and Ruth is another one who is just he just, he just takes me back but every time I wrestle or I see him wrestle it's just like he's improved from the week before and just to see him go out and mop up uh, Ohio State's who, who was it Nick Hunt just to see him go out there and mop up in two minutes five seconds like that
I really don't see Ruth even, even losing one this year. It's a Muchigastegi. I think I got that right. Muchigastegi. Right. There you go. So the yeah. other thing we got to watch for Ed is can he handle a leg Turk, which is what uh, uh, Stanford kid put on him and uh, twisted his knee and knocked him out of the, the I think it was the quarters or the semis there. But, uh, yeah, I did at the beginning of the year. I was saying, you know, everybody was talking Jordan Oliver, Matt McDonough, David Taylor for the Hodge. I was saying this Ed was my dark horse pick. But with all those top guys, you know, Oliver losing, McDonough losing, uh you got to think David and Ed Ruth are one and two for uh, the, the Hodge voting for the end of the year. So. Yeah, right up there with Kyle Pink. I didn't go through. I mean, yes, I forgot Kyle, yeah. Keep an eye on. Um, keep an eye on. Ed, uh, excuse me, Quentin Wright had uh, a couple good uh, performances also. He pinned a kid in the, the first period right there. Um, again, from just. Uh, he got out of the escape against. Um, Oh, I can't remember what was it was against Thomas, who uh, Megram yeah. wasn't able to wrestle for Iowa State, so that kid was obviously overmatched from the get go. But he just he came out of the the uh, from defensive position beginning of the period, just popped right out and just hit the kid with a lead lock, head lock, and that was over. And against uh, Iowa, against Vinny Wagner, he hit that uh, standing flip right there. Everybody thought again he was getting the fall. So Quentin Wright is proving to be. Uh, for the record, all faithful, the the most exciting guy in the mat because you just never know what's going to happen with him when he's out there. Yeah, he loves those big scrubs. I mean, that's something that's not just been Quinn Wright's trademark. I mean, being that good to be the bald eagle, and he just loves those big moves. And he just, like you're saying, uh, the Iowa match, he had that tremendous opportunity on the boundary. I thought for sure he was going to deck, deck Wagner right there. Hope that was in the second period, but, you know, Wagner fought off. Wagner actually put up a really good fight. I, I fought against Quentin. Um, he, you know, for, he, he got a good shot in on Quentin, too, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then against Ohio State and, you know, against Thomas, even though he wasn't the first string guy at 184 for the Buckeyes, uh, Quentin just mopped him up. And that headlock, that was, that was definitely something to see there. And he just exploded out. And Thomas left the head hanging. And Quentin capitalized, and it was just done before you know it. Um, so yeah, he uh, he's definitely on a path to to repeat. But like like we've discussed, one eighty four is very loaded at the top five guys. It's a meat grinder. And, and, yeah, and they're gonna be up on each other. But if uh, Quentin Quentin's proved that he's a tournament wrestler, and so he might not even see the best of him yet this year. But you know, this weekend he'll actually have a pretty a pretty tough test in Nebraska's uh, Enon. He was be the number seven guy at 184 this year, so he hasn't really, uh, you know, beat anyone too big this year. But you know, that'll be a good, uh, t- good test for for Quinn against that guy when they travel to Nebraska. So the the one guy you got to really admire for the last two weeks is uh, Morgan McIntosh, um, having suffered a couple of, like close losses to some tough guys. He's really uh, shown me a lot of mental toughness, especially against. Uh, Capolitano when he tweaked his knee and he still kept on and he he won that bout and the, then the sudden sudden death victory over uh, Gambrel uh, to clinch the duel for uh, Penn State and that just brought the house down in case anybody you know missed that one uh, but I just I'm really um, I'm really impressed with uh, just Morgan persisting and uh, getting better as the year comes along here. Yeah, yeah, more that match against Iowa, like you said when. Morgan McIntosh basically sealed the deal for for Penn State and their dual meet date there. That has really just kind of said to me that Morgan McIntosh has finally trusted himself to the to the speed of the college game. Now he was, you know, he's been a man amongst boys since he's been what 16, 15 years old. But once he got up to college, and I saw guys like Cody Yaw, or um, saw guys like Yawn from Minnesota, you know, he's did have some struggles there, especially when it got down to the last 30 seconds of the match. And that's kind of where the question marks were around Morgan McIntosh. But now, after you see that he's able to win a close battle with Gambrel that went into the went into overtime, you know, that kind of shows that, hey, Morgan McIntosh might finally be adjusted to this level. Now we might really start seeing what we've heard about for so long. Um, and then what he went out and fought against Campotano and I, I believe I've heard a lot of people say it too that the score the five three five four score that that it ended at didn't really describe the way that Morgan Mac 
Josh kind of owned that match. I felt like he was in control basically the entire time. Set the momentum, set the tone of the match right from the whistle. Um, and I think that must be said when he tweaked his knee, he just for him to bounce back that quickly and still be able to you know, hold off for the victory just kind of shows that he's maturing and he just has that that fire in him that you know he's not going to be denied. And I think he he just really wants to be an All American this year. Well, he's definitely added the ankle pick to his repertory, thanks to Kale, but that's what, you know, it just looked like Capilitano had no answer for that. He got in on it two or three times right there, so. Uh, yeah, he was just attacking those feet. He was just attacking those feet, but one thing I did here, I'll pass along while I was up to practice. I talked to Morgan quick just to see how the deep was doing. Just, I don't know if you hadn't watched the match, uh, it got into a little scramble, and Capilitano reached around, grabbed the foot of Morgan, and kind of just wrenched it in a different direction and Morgan said it didn't pop but he could feel something tweaked in there so they stopped the match got up, had a couple, little bit of injury time and then they were back at it but after the match Morgan was iced up and he'd been iced ice in the knee pretty heavily for the last couple of days uh, so for this weekend when they travel to Nebraska Gale's actually going to bring along Justin Ortega uh, the second string one might be seven pounder just in case Morgan if I'm feeling up to it or if by chance that they already had the meat the dual meat in their hands you know they might just save Morgan make sure he doesn't do any more any more damage to the meat and send Ortega out so Ortega is definitely going to go to Nebraska with him and this is something to keep an eye out for this weekend just kind of see how that knee's really open up for Morgan yeah, that's, I think, pretty smart if he doesn't make it. Uh, you know, Penn State's got a will in hand, and I think it'd be best to just kind of let him rest for the week. Exactly. Uh, and then Cameron Wade, he had a really uh, simple, impressive win against uh, Blake Raising. And then, um, you know, Major uh, Capone, who was actually last year, he was Ohio State's uh, 184 pounder. So, a couple of really good wins for uh, Cameron that's going to really help him in the seedings this year. Is right now, he looks like he's headed for uh, a number two seed in the Big Tens. Yeah, yeah, there's two good wins for him. Uh, you know, Tip Boyer Cameron Wade wins actually against Iowa when he had uh, Blake Raising. He actually had a really nice ankle pick, low single leg type of shot that just really caught everyone in the stands, you know, just kind of off guard because it was one of those shots that could be 141 pounders hit, you know, now you're 285. And it just kind of shows quite, or excuse me, Cameron does have that capability in him. But like we said, it's just kind of sometimes when he's wrestling different guys, I feel like he gets thrown off his game and doesn't make those quick moves that, you know, makes Cameron so good. Uh, but this weekend coming up against Nebraska and Michigan, he's going to have another couple tough tasks. Yes, he is. He the number nine and the number ten guy, you know, right back to back. Um, you know, one of them being Ben Applin, which they have had quite a history together from Michigan. Uh, so he, these two matches, like you were saying, Cameron should have a, at least a number two seed for the Big Ten tournament, but he needs to win these first these two matches this weekend. Yeah, it was... I was getting ahead of myself there. Yeah, I know Tucker Lane's pretty tough. He's actually had uh, a win, a couple of really good wins this year, too, himself. All right, why don't we take a look at, um, real quickly here, Penn State's got a doubleheader this weekend. they got to go all the way out to Nebraska on Thursday, wrestle on Friday, and then come back home on Saturday, wrestle Michigan in Rec Hall on Sunday. Um, the way they line up against uh, Nebraska, the first match against Sean Nagel, who is uh, six and fourteen, uh, you know, even lost by Tech Fall to Olenowski and was pinned by McDonough. You know, uh, definitely, I'm looking for Nico to get the bonus right here and start Penn State off really quick and fast. Yeah, he, Nico's going to need the bonus there, um, especially you know with this, this weird weekend coming up. He, Nico's going to need to go out there and set the tone for the team, which he loves doing. He, uh, he embraces that role. But it's, like you are saying, it's going to be a little bit of a unique situation for Penn State this weekend because they're in Nebraska Friday night and then have to be back Sunday. And they're actually, right now they're actually calling for a rain snowstorm in the Nebraska area Friday night and into Saturday. So, Ooh. you know, there is a, there is some, this possibility that you know, there could be some delays and might have a little bit of a tough time coming back to Pennsylvania after for Sunday's match. But, you know, I talked to Cale about that and he to see if he had any plans. And he's not stressing over it too much. He said, you know, the team is more than capable to prepare themselves for, you know, anything that comes their way. You know, he said even if they 
have to, you know, suck weight on the bus and run uh, wind sprints in their plane terminals. They'll, you know, they'll make sure that they're going to be prepared for Sunday's match. Just another thing to keep an eye out for. Um, so then 133, we've got uh, Frank going to be going against uh, Ridge Kiley, who's, I think, ranked 17th or 18th. Um, now Kylie actually has wrestled a lot of guys that Martelletti has and uh, hasn't been beat as badly, but um, he also had a major over McQuaid like, um, from Wisconsin like like uh, Frank had. So this is going to be, I think, a pretty even match and especially a nice road test for Frank to really put himself back on the map and uh, get some momentum going for himself like we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a match that he really needs. Uh, same thing with Sunday's match against Michigan. They're just Match that both of them are a lot. He really needs to, you know, stay alive for a seat on big time tournament time. Um. Then again, like I was saying, Jake Souflon against Brian Pearsall. Uh, Brian's going to definitely have a tough time here. Uh, Souflon is nineteen and five. I think he's uh, ranked about sixth. Uh, he lost to Montel Marion a couple weeks ago, nine to six. Lost to um, Kellen Russell, got majored by him. Lost to Mike Mangrum, but has had um, a couple of really good, solid wins. He beat uh, Hunter Stieber. He majored him. And, uh, on Stieber. Yep, and um, beat uh, Tyler Small from Kent State. Beat uh, Evan Henderson from North Carolina, who's had a pretty good year. He's been a top 20 wrestler. Uh so uh, Brian's going to have his uh, work cut out for especially being on the road in the Big Ten. So I'm hoping that he can uh, keep this decision. I have a kind of feeling he might get majored here, though. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be tough for him to, to not get majored, but that's also kind of how what Pierce Hall does. He takes people by surprise here and keeps the matches that a lot of people don't think he'll keep close. He keeps them close right down to the edge. So, you know, he can't count Pierce Hall out until the, the final whistle there. No, uh, Frank has got uh, Brandon Wilpern, who is ten and seven. Um, this should be no brainer. This should be some bonus for Frank here. Uh, I think Penn State will be really disappointed if he doesn't, because uh, uh, you know he's he's lost a lot of guys that Frank has already beaten. He's kind of had a mediocre year here. Yeah, I'm going to predict a major decision and then Frank's twelfth twelfth shutout victory there. Frank. There you go. One forty nine. <laughs> Uh, 157, here's probably the feature match. As we mentioned before, James Green, who is 19-2, and two, his only losses. Um, kind of like upsets to a kid from Bucknell and uh, to Molly Schuster. Other than that, um, he's uh, kind of rolled through his lineup here, his whole schedule. He- yeah, some, some of those losses, they kind of catch my eye because, you know, Dylan's, Dylan's had some losses too, but they've been to some pretty, pretty stiff, guys, stiff competition. And Green does look like he's had, maybe had a couple letdowns along the way. Uh, and as long as I feel, as long as Dylan avoids those type of letdowns, I think he'll it'll be a, um, a winner up here at 157. Maybe not any bonus points here, but I think he'll be able to at least win by two. And just to kind of give you an idea how close they're kind of comparing, you know, uh, Dylan beats. Anthony Jones from Michigan State won nothing. Green won that three to two. Uh, he beat uh, James Green. Beat uh, Nick Moore twelve to seven. Beat Josh Demas seven to four. So some kind of similar results, difference wise. It's going to definitely be um, an interesting matchup. I think everybody's going to be listening to Jeff Byers do this one uh, on Friday night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, let's see. Oh. You know, this actually is not going to be uh, some slouch. Uh, you know, super freshman uh, Robert Kokesh last year had this phenomenal redshirt year where I, I think he went something like 18-1 and one or something like this. And uh, he's, uh, I think, ranked 6th or 7th right now. Uh, he lost to Mike Evans uh, a couple weeks ago, but he uh, majored Ben Jordan from Wisconsin. Um he beat Sean Ofer from Wyoming, 5 nothing. who he was ranked in the top two or three at the beginning of the year. So um, uh, Kokesh is uh, definitely, you know, very talented kid, and David's going to have his hands full, especially, you know, being out in Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, this will be another one to keep an eye on, uh, out for. Uh, I don't believe David will do anything less than a major decision. He might even be able to pull a tech call here. Uh, but, yeah, Kokesh. 
Oshkosh is, is talented. He's had some really quality wins. You know, even right up the last week, he beat Ben Jordan from Wisconsin. Major decision to actually. So it, the Kokesh is talented, but it, as we've seen, is basically the only way to keep a match close with David Taylor is to stay on the defensive the whole time and <laughs> yeah. not be able to match it. So, um, you know, I still think David will keep this, you know, anywhere between an 8 and a 15 point match. Um, 174, Ed going against uh, Tyler Cohn, um, whose record is 15-7 uh, and seven in year. But, uh, you know, he has lost to Heflin. He's lost to Lofthouse. Uh, I really can't see anybody stopping Ed at this point, so I'm just going to call another fall for him. Yeah, I uh, think it's going to be a cradle. If, I, if that's going out on a <laughs> limb, I'm not sure. But I think we're going to be a cradle fall here, 174. You're a psychic. Uh, 184, uh, like you mentioned before, a tough battle for uh, Quentin with Josh Enan, uh, who's got an 18-2 and two record. His only losses are Joe DeBlanc uh, two times and um, beat Ian Hinton and uh, majored Craig Thomas, who uh, Quentin just uh, pinned the other day. So he's, he's definitely going to have uh, a tougher match here, but I think Quentin's definitely going to get the uh, decision here. Yeah, he's definitely favored basically in any way you put it. This I mean, Ian's good, he's got a good, good ranking and all, but he just doesn't really have any marquee victories on his resume yet this year. And you know, I'm sure Quentin doesn't want to be the first one, so I think it's gonna I'm thinking it's at least a regular decision here and you know, knowing Quentin it's either gonna be a regular decision or fall, so it's just gonna see how it falls falls into place. Uh one ninety seven Hopefully you'll be kind of uh, wrapped up by then, and then we can uh, have um, Morgan take the week off and let Justin uh, see who seems to have uh, proved a bit this year. But um, he's going to go against, uh, I can't even pronounce the kid's name, Nishima? Nakashima. Yeah, Nishima. There you go. Yeah, and he's actually, a, I've seen him wrestle quite a few different times, and he's actually quite a quite a horse out there. He's really strong and yeah, I've actually some of the guys that Morgan has had struggles with this year have been some of your big strong one ninety seven pounders. So that's one thing you might want to keep an eye out for when they when they meet, if they meet. Um but you're saying I think it might be, you know, the smarter idea to keep just a polar tag out there because more than likely this match will be well out of hand by this one ninety seven bow and why not why uh, you know, go out there and force uh, you know, push an injury perhaps and just let Ortega go out there and, you know, take care of this stuff. Yeah, Nakashima actually a couple of weeks ago lost to Gamble and Capolitano. So, uh, by comparison, uh, I think Morgan would be kind of favored anyways. And he, uh, Nakashima isn't even ranked in the top 20. But, uh, yeah, he's still a good, strong kid. Uh, another big match here, Tucker Lane and uh, Cameron Wade. Tucker is 20-2 uh, and two on the year. Uh, lost to Atticus Disney and uh, had another loss to Brendan Barlow. I actually think he also lost to a uh, kid from Indiana, but I don't see it uh, on his record at all. So he's having a pretty good year. Uh, he beat Bobby Telford a couple weeks ago, the super uh, redshirt freshman from Iowa, who's actually a multiple state champion from uh, Delaware, and uh, beat Capone uh, from uh, Ohio State. So Ranked in the top ten pretty consistently for most of the year, and um, should be a good match for for uh, Cameron. But I see him, you know, pulling out a decision here. Yeah, the only the only thing, the thing I see, you know, as we've talked before, is um, Cameron has struggled with consistency, and it does almost look like uh, the, uh, what's his name here, Lane from Nebraska. It almost seems like he struggled with consistency too, because he had some of those, some strange losses on, on his record. Um, but he also had some pretty good wins, like you pointed out. But also, he's uh, he even beat Levi Cooper from Arizona State, who is at one point the top ranked heavyweight in the country. Um, he actually beat him in putt and victory. So that's just uh, that's it's going to be a tight match. I think Cameron's more than capable of pulling it out. But as we've seen, it just kind of depends on which Cameron shows up in Nebraska. Yeah. So you know, I'm I'm thinking this. Um, if Penn State, everything kind of goes their way, they could uh, blow these guys out of the water again. But um, 
I don't really see Nebraska, even if they win a couple of the, the toss-up matches, I don't see them being a threat here in Penn State should still win by uh, 10, 15 points. Yeah, yeah, they should, this should be at least a 15-point match, you know, depending on how the bonus points play out. Uh, you know, there's a chance that Nebraska will only pull out you know, maybe even six points total, depending on how 133 and 141 plays out. And then, of course, 97 to 85. But the yeah, Nebraska could win four matches here when we're all been done. But, yeah, I think it's going to be more like two or three. All right, so then on to Michigan real quick. Uh, when Penn State comes back on Sunday from their long trip from Nebraska, uh, Nico comes up against Grant Pizzo. He's got a 6-11 and record. This doesn't look to be too much of a challenge since, uh, let's see, got major by Zach Sanders, is got major by uh, Delgado, was pinned by Melly. So I definitely see uh, Nico jumping off the bat. We know Kale's going to go with 125 start and uh, probably get some sort of bonus here in this match. Yeah, I think Nico is all set and done to be able to score at least nine point, 19 points between the two matches. So I'm thinking he'll, either, he'll be able to get a major decision and possibly tech ball on one of these two. Cause I, you know, I don't think either will present much of a challenge for him. Uh, 133, again, we've got a chance for uh, Frank to kind of rebound. Zach Stevens, let's see, um, where is he ranked at right now? I know he's in the top 20, I'm pretty sure. He just dropped out of the top 20 oh, okay. this week. He, uh, he was, I think, for, for this weekend, and I believe he uh, might have lost one of his matches. So. so, yeah, he just dropped out of the top 20 this week. Oh, yeah, he lost to Dardanes, uh, Minnesota, a couple of weeks ago, or uh, last week. So, um, that would probably kind of put her to toss up, though some people might think that uh, the way Martellotti's been wrestling, he would give the edge to Stevens. But uh, just knowing, you know, both you and I knowing what uh, he's capable of, especially at home, I think he's going to be really uh, pressed to do well and, and get a decision here. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, really good. Pearsall going up against Kellen Russell. Now, last year, you know, Kellen didn't score a lot of bonus, but he's kind of been on a tear lately with some falls, major decisions, tech falls. So, um, but in front of the home crowd, I think again we're going to see Brian Pearsall keep it under under the bonus, and uh, Kellen, I give him just a decision at this point. Yeah, after Kellen got beat by Hunter Stever, there, the true freshman, I think Kellen has kind of been on a tear since then. He's just He's been pissed him off a little bit, and now he's been taken out on all of his opponents. Now, hopefully, Ben State here solves that the next one in line. And like you're saying, in front of a home crowd and just knowing here solves history against top opponents, you kind of have to, you yeah, kind of have to expect that he'll be able to keep this match within four or five points. And like I said earlier, if he's able to do that and keep Allen Russell from scoring any bonus points, then you got to look at that as a win almost. Uh, 149, uh, Eric Hollis from Michigan, who was um, out of where uh, I live down here in the Tampa Bay area, and he went to Brandon High School. Um, <clears throat> big phenom coming out. I think he was the number two recruit behind David Taylor a couple years ago. So Frank has had uh, increasingly had his hands filled with him. Uh, Grahalis also has a good Greco background, so he's been able to handle the upper body stuff, but I think Frank is definitely going to get the decision here again. He'll be able to do much more than a regular decision in this match. Just given Gorilla's strength, that you said, you know, he's he's um, proven time and time again, even against Frank, that he's not always the easiest opponent to draw. Even though, you know, sometimes on paper he'll be the kind of kind of you know, on paper he doesn't always look like he stacks up well, but he always goes out there and puts up strong performance, does performances, and he's actually coming off a big win over. Coming in, coming in. This is uh, Sunday's match. But um, Trey Baldwin was really going to 
have to be on his toes with him. Yeah, he's also kind of coming off uh, a bit of an injury because I know um, uh, he beat uh, Van Olen from Air Force, who's now number three in the rankings, but he majored him, and then uh, I think he was out for about a month. So he's just getting himself back and roll. But uh, Frank will definitely, I think, get the uh, decision here. Uh, 157. We have uh, Dylan Alton going against uh, another one of the Zarep brothers, Brandon. His record is about 12-7. and 7. I think uh, Dylan gets the uh, decision here, if not the uh, major. Yeah, this is, I mean, Zarep's good. He's, uh, he's not as good as his older, or older brother, I believe. They're brothers. Um, he, but it's going to be a test for Dylan. And this is what we're really going to see what Dylan's made of. Because I think Dylan is capable of scoring bonus points and points on him. Zarep has actually been pretty inconsistent when he got gave up the fall to Jackson Morris, who uh, beat Dylan in the um, Dapper Dam Classic by you know one point in the last second right there. So uh, I, I definitely think you know the expectation here is Dylan has to get uh, some bonus points out of this one. Uh, one sixty five, Dan Yates. I think he's ranked in the top twenty, but uh, again, this looks like a David Taylor setup for a, a Tech fall. I think pretty sure. Uh, 174 actually should be pretty um, one of the better matches here. Uh, Brandon's older brother Justin, who has been ranked in the top 10 all year, he had a couple good wins uh, earlier in the year. Beat uh, Ethan Headley from Pittsburgh. Um, uh, lost to uh, the Roaches from Cal Poly. He's ranked number three right now by a point. Um, he did give up a last-second overtime uh, takedown and lost to Storley. Um, a big win for Storley the other day. So uh, I think, though, Ed is definitely going to get, uh, I don't know if he's going to get the fall, but he, he'll he definitely, I think, get some bonus. He'll get at least a major out of this. Yeah, I agree. I don't think he'll be able to get the fall here. But, again, this is going to be another uh, one year I want to keep an eye out for because if Sarah is able to go the full seven minutes with Ed Ruiz, you know, that's something that Ed's going to need to get used to going into the postseason. And, and realistically, he's had quite a few falls this year where, Uh, 184 under Collars from Michigan has got a record of six and nine. Um, this just this is just bonus for uh, for Quentin. He's got to either get the fall or probably major. I mean, I think he's had maybe like one or two tech falls his whole career. So this is going to either be the major or a fall. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I I don't I, I feel like if he doesn't get the fall here, um, you know, something's wrong. <laughs> um, now 197. This will be an interesting matchup. I know. Um, Max Huntley from uh, Michigan, uh, Richard Freshman. I think he uh, hurt himself against Sonny Young a couple weeks ago. So I don't know if he's actually going to be in the lineup, but if he is, it's going to be a very good test for uh, Morgan McIntosh going against another good young kid. Yeah, that would be a good test. I hope Huntley's healthy enough to go out for him. Um, you know, he's staying with Morgan, though. You know, you hope Morgan's healthy. That you don't want either of them to go out there and push any type of injury because both both guys are going to be relied on for. Yeah, I mean, uh, if Huntley doesn't go, I think Morgan or Justin Ortega, whoever goes at 197, will have a problem with Hills. Uh, so we'll just kind of have to wait and see who goes for Michigan and and State for that matter. Yeah, this could be definitely the backup poll right here. So, and then we finish yeah. off with uh, a familiar opponent for uh, Cameron Raid and a lot of Penn State fans who recognize Ben Applin, who. Um, Cameron at the um, Southern Scuffle last year 
scored uh, points on him when Penn State needed uh, Cameron to come through that brought them to a tie with Cornell, kind of set the stage for the rest of the year, and then he actually in the consolations faced Ben again and got the bonus when he needed to give Penn State the one-point win over Iowa. So uh, a lot of history between these guys, but uh, I think Cameron again just uh, comes away with a good, solid decision here. Yeah, Ben Athens is one of the few heavyweights that Cameron has consistently beaten as since they've been on campus. Uh, I don't expect anything less going into this match, but you know, I think it's going to be a close one. I think we'll see a 3-2 match, 4-3, something. You know, if there's much more of a differential than two points, I'll be, you know, I'll be surprised after that. So again, this looks like you know pretty much. Uh, Eight to nine uh, wins for Penn State, and they'll probably be going away with about a 20, 25 point win, if not more, depending upon uh, how Kellen Russell does right there. But uh, it looks like it's set up, you know, Penn State's been on a roll. Uh, if they can keep it up, if they can come out with some, you know, 20 to 25 point dual wheat wins, uh, they'll just continue uh, getting better. That's the one thing that when we were listening to Ed Ruth, uh, there was an interview, I think you were there when he was doing it, talking about somebody's like, going, do you think you're getting your stride, your peak? And he's like, no, I think I'm just getting started. You know, I'm just starting to get better. So that's the kind of scary thought about how good this team can be. But uh, I think this week they'll have a couple good challenges there. We'll be able to see just a little bit more as the season wears on what's going on. Yeah, but right now, I believe, you know, they're wrestling at the all time. Uh, they're all time best for the season, you know. But like Ruth and plenty of others say, they still feel like they need improvements. And it's scary to think, but that is kind of how Cal coaches his team, and so that they peak going into the postseason. And I mean, Cal's hoping that they're not peaking right now, and because he wants them to, you know, peak in March. So if they keep on, you know, cruising, I think they're gonna, you know, pick up at least. Of these wins this weekend out of the 20, maybe even more. Um, and, you know, that just kind of proves that, like I said in the beginning of the conversation, that, you know, Penn State is beginning to separate itself from the Big Ten this year. And, uh, you know, they're going to go into the Big Ten tournament sitting pretty. So, uh, Tim, you've got, I know, a busy day tomorrow. You've got uh, National Signing Day for the football team. So maybe uh, next week we can you can impart a couple uh, words of wisdom about that for us. Yeah, it's supposed to be about 19 guys signing their letter of intent tomorrow, maybe more, if a couple guys full surprise. But there'll be another busy week this week you know, at Blue White Illustrated doing that. Uh, but we will be at Rack Hall Sunday covering the Michigan match. Um, and we'll have, you know, we'll have our normal coverage all week from just our, from our wrestling room. So uh, stay tuned to follow me on Twitter at Tim underscore Owen, E-W-I. Are you going to have an article about the recruiting class on BWI? Yeah, there will be tons of different articles um, popping up tomorrow. Uh, every time that we get word that someone sent in their letter of intent, we'll be posting a profile and a small biography and an analysis of each and every new recruit that Penn State's bringing in. And like I said, there should be 19 of them and maybe a couple surprises. But right now, it kind of looks like they'll cap it at 19 for this class of 2012. Great. All right. Well, we've just about pushed it an hour this week, trying to cover two weeks in one week. So I'm going to end off here, and then uh, we'll talk to you next week, Tim. Sounds good. We'll catch up with you later. All right.